Now, and you've got to look for dangers and opportunities that you can see as the third wave evolves. I mean, there is a real danger we'll leave the poor behind. There's a real danger that 45 or 50 year olds who've invested their whole life in their company are now going to find themselves uh, temporarily obsolesced. And the question is, can you rethink the system so it's temporary rather than permanent? Because I would argue you need to foc we need to focus as much on lifetime learning for 50 year olds as we do on lifetime learning for 5 year olds. Because if you grew up and were trained here and had a sense of stability, you feel really cheated here. And so we really have to come to grips with how are we going to make lifetime learning real? How do we help people start their own businesses? How do we help people make a new career? You can't, if you're going to live to be 90 or 100, you can't say to somebody you're obsolete at 50. You cannot have a society which says to an entire generation of people, sorry that you were born a little bit too early, you don't quite get it, good luck. And instead what you've got to do is think, how are we going to reintegrate and reabsorb all the energy and talent? Remembering, people are going to live a lot longer. And that's going to have all sorts of implications on pension plans and retirement and what does it mean and how much you have to... To save all your working life to live for five years after retirement is one thing. To save all your working life to live 40 years after retirement is a different thing and probably unsustainable. Probably means that, that like, like Drucker, I mean like Drucker and Deming, that there's some level of activity involved for most of your lifetime because it's inconceivable that you can get people to save. I mean, the level of, of, of savings you'd have to engage in in order to be able to, to retire for 40 years is, is going to be a very small number of people. And so, as all these changes occur, we've got to be open and available to rethinking. It also means that the same event can occur and one person can see an opportunity while another sees danger in the, at the exact same moment. So, the software writer at Microsoft thought it was wonderful and the centralized hardware computer at IBM thought it was terrible. And the same events occurring, and you're getting two very different descriptions at the same moment. The rise of integration was wonderful if you were black, and if you were a white segregationist, it was terrifying. The sudden level of change, I mean, here you had, and then something Drucker wrote about 30 years ago. You had blacks who were finally entering the industrial era and finally getting a good job in Detroit the week the factory closed and was being replaced by white upper middle class software writers. And all the terms of engagement changed just as people began to survive, to succeed. So you've got to be very sensitive to the fact and you've got to listen carefully because you can both be describing the same event but your viewpoints are so different. That you've got to know, you've got to walk, I, I describe it as walking all the way around the tree. You've got to be willing to stop and walk all the way around the tree and see the event from their viewpoint. Darrell Connor's term for it is appreciative understanding. You don't have to agree, but you have to appreciate why they would feel that way and why you might feel that way if you were in their shoes. That doesn't mean they're right, but it means it's real. For them, this is true. And you've got to work at that if you want to hold your society together. And you've got to study the earlier transitions. We can learn lessons from Britain between 1720 and 1850. We can learn lessons from America, uh, uh, 1750 to 1915 from Japan, 1854 to 1930, Germany, 1830 to 1914, Russia, 1850 to 1917. All those were transition periods for those societies as they left the agricultural era and they went into the industrial era. Now, what did they do? How did they respond? What were the tensions in their periods? How do people respond in family structure, in politics, in, in entrepreneurship? And I think that there are also uh, lessons to be learned about how countries, companies, and individuals change. Uh, Daryl Connor's work, uh, which I mentioned to you earlier, uh, managing at the speed of change. What Daryl attempts to do here, based on about 25 years of, of consulting, is to show you the consistent patterns by which human beings tend to respond as human beings. How do people respond to the process of change? Uh, and how do they go through it? Uh, another book I, I've seen recently that's, that's helpful in that is, is uh, Maura Schechtman's uh, Working Without a Net, uh, and, in which Schechtman walks you through the scale of change we're living through. Dr. Barbara Lawton, who you met last week, who helped us do the uh, Red Beat experiment, wrote a note about this week's class. And she, has, she had a bunch of specific ideas we'll share with you in detail. But for example, she says, coming into this, the transition, it seems like all the structures, institutions, relationships, the pillars of our everyday existence are threatened. Uh, pensions, lifelong employment, jobs in manufacturing, traditional teaching, learning relationships. Things in life must be broken apart before it can be rearranged into more effective ways of living. In other words, you'll see the thawing at a rate faster 
then you'll see the refreezing. So early on, the insecurity will increase, and the threat of tension to old institutions will increase. From numerous early experiments, successful patterns will emerge. And this is a very important part of this. One of the reasons you want to decentralize is so you have lots of parallel experiments, and then, you, and then it's not like you can predict the winners. But you, you notice the winners as they occur, and you orient to the winners as they occur. Nobody in 1950 could have predicted McDonald's, but it's easy to find McDonald's at a later point. And you start to say, wow, this must be working, because you see more and more of them. As, as you saw more golden arches, it began pretty obvious. Now, she says, what it demands from all of us personally, it breaks our expectations about our future. We live within a framework of implied contracts. Like if I do a good job and I'm loyal, my company is going to keep me forever. Well, what if your company can't? What if the whole world changes? What if the market replaces your product? Um, the change seems unfair. I've done my job. How come it's changing? But the objective fact is it's that big a world. There are that many things going on. She said, we need the understanding to recognize that what we're experiencing is not someone else trying to cheat or deprive us, but is the result of our own collective action. That is, that the third wave is so huge that it's not about somebody else conspiring to take away your stability. It's about the world changing and us going with the change. It's sort of like being in the middle of an earthquake and saying, boy, I'll bet you know, the rich did this to us or the unions did this to us. Or, you know, no, it's, it was an earthquake. I mean, the planet did it to us. And in a sense, the third wave is that big a change. It's a planetary change. She said, we need the personal strength to put our energy into creating the new experiments and developing pathways into the future rather than into denying the change and finding ways to patch a system whose time has passed. We all need the understanding of profound knowledge, which is Deming's term, to develop new methods of working processes and systems for the third wave world. We must be active learners looking for the new patterns underlying the themes. And so I think this concept, one of the habits of the future will be that we have to all be active learners, that we have to take responsibility. And in the process of that learning, what I'm suggesting is that how we apply the five pillars of American civilization help us think through the process of change from a second to third wave civilization. Uh, remembering that the five pillars of American civilization are first the historic lessons of American civilization, second personal strength, third entrepreneurial free enterprise, fourth the spirit of invention and discovery, <coughs> and fifth quality as defined by Edwards Deming. And what I'm suggesting is that we literally go back through and that you get a, a habit in your head when you bounce into a new situation, a new problem, a new opportunity of trying to apply all. Start with applying the historic lessons of American civilization to the emerging third wave information age. And here, what I would suggest is that you go back and you say, all right, how did we change the last time? Fulton's invention of the steamboat, the rise of the railroad. What, what was it like to go from the stagecoach through the Pony Express to the railroad? How did people adjust to those changes? What about towns that died because they weren't on the railroad? Towns that exploded like Atlanta because they were on the railroad? The importance of the railheads in Chicago and Buffalo. And you suddenly have a whole different pattern. Okay? Second, personal strength in a third wave information age. And it seems to me pretty clear that if you're going to make it through the, 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 the freezing, I mean the, the rethawing and the refreezing, it takes a lot of personal strength. Uh, and, and those people who have the personal strength to be active learners, those people who are able to go out and actively do the right kind of things, are going to face dramatically greater opportunities than people who get up in the morning and passively wait for somebody else to invent the future. Darrell Connor along that line has a model of change which I found very helpful in which he says that resilience is the key factor. And what he means by resilience is, and his whole point is, this kind of change is never easy. So if you get in a habit of when you make a mistake, you get back up. If you think about learning how to ski. <coughs> if you have the resilience to get back up after you fall down and get back up after you fall down, and you have the sheer energy and the optimism and the drive to say, OK, so I've fallen down nine times. I think I'll try a tenth time. You are much more likely to learn how to ski than if the third time you fall, you say, that's it, I can't do it. And then you leave for two days or a week or a year and you come back. Well, the same thing's true of all kinds of active learning and all kinds of inventing of the future. Uh, leading an organization, what we're doing in the house today. I mean, all these things, the more resilience you have, the greater your capacity to get things done. Which leads you, of course, to entrepreneurial free enterprise and the process of entering the information age. That the more rapidly you can invent and develop the future, the better off you are. Did, did you want to? 